So joining me today on the River Trent, one of my favourite all-time venues to be fair. Lovely bit of water here at Stoke Bardolph with the Ashfield Anglers Club's piece of water, brilliant piece of water because whenever I go fishing on a river, always what I think to myself is you just never know what's going to happen next. You, you know, every peg you sit on is a little bit different. Everywhere you cast out on that particular peg could provide something a bit different. There could be a three pound perch lurking right there off the end of my uh, rod. You know, there could be a barbel, there could be roach, dace, anything. And <clears throat> there really could be anything. So it's one of the mysteries about fishing that I love so much. Now I've brought you just to show a really simple feeder fishing approach today because love to see more and more people out on the river. Seeing people, loads of people out on the river, it's great. I love to see it. It's what keeps everything thriving. We're putting bait in the water, it's great. So hopefully this approach that I'm gonna show you today, I've only set one rod up. I've not got loads of top kits set up. I've not got loads of different rods set up. Just come for a day's fishing so you can have a look at it and think, yeah, I wanna go and have a go at that. I wanna go and have a go at river feeder fishing. It can be really simple. So. First of all, I want to talk about where to cast. <clears throat> because when you've got the feeder rod in your hand, your gut reaction is, oh, I must cast it middle of the river. Well, that is for me and a lot of other people as well, but it doesn't always have to be like that. Now, today I'm on, as the, as the river comes around, I'm going to call it the outside of a bend. Some people might call it the inside, but for me, it's, it's where the water's pushing into. So as it comes at a straight, it's then going to kick off slightly that way which means that the flow is all at my feet. So when I sit down, I can see there's loads of flow literally just here off my rod end. And where that duck is swimming there, he's really struggling to push it upstream against the current. So I can see there's a lot of flow this side of the river. Now, naturally, where there's a lot of flow, there's going to be a lot of depth because the flow obviously wears away at the, at the ground over time. The ground is likely to be clean and hard. It's gonna have you know, stone and that on, because silt's not gonna gather there because that's where the flow is. So that's the first place I look to fish. Now, when I cast my feeder out here today, I cast it out in anything from about 10 meters. I've got a good, I'm gonna say 10 foot of water. I count it out with my ounce bomb. It's gonna take at least three or four seconds to hit the bottom. That's great. And then when I cast it further, it didn't get any deeper. It just pretty much stays a similar type of depth. So for me, there's no need to go miles out into the river. Now, of course, 10 meters is actually quite an awkward distance to cast and fish. So I've opted for about 13 meters today, just that little bit further, a little bit more comfortable, but you might be thinking, wow, Lee, that's incredibly short for feeder fishing. But it, that's the whole point. You don't have to, exert yourself you don't have to go too far just make sure obviously the further you go the more line you've got in the water the more opportunity you've got for the flow to pick up that line and it means everything has to be a little bit heavier so i always look for the shortest possible place to fish that's the first thing that i really want you to consider now once you've decided where to fish it's important to look at your setup now <clears throat> whenever i'm on flowing water like the river trent or any river where there is what I'm gonna call significant flow. Not one of these rivers that just slowly tickles through. I'm talking about a river where the water clearly pushes through in front of you. And there's loads of those up and down the country and across Europe. I always opt for a 12 foot rod. Okay, I don't want a short rod. I don't, I need a rod that if I wanna pick my line up off the surface of the water, I can do. So I've gone for the 12 foot Superior X today and it's a rod that I spent a long time working on actually on the river trend and I'm saying it's the it's the best feeder rod I've I've used ever as simple as that it just works brilliantly it's got loads of strength down here so if I want to cast two ounces which is 60 grams no problem today that's a 50 gram feeder but I only need about 40 to hold it's going to absolutely eat that up and when you go river fishing and feeder fishing everything's got to be easy don't be struggling. Don't have your little light 10 footer trying to cast out a two ounce feeder. Make everything comfortable and you'll find your fishing more comfortable. So that's reflected then on my reel and line choice. So I've got six pound, which is 023 sinking feeder mono. 
no shock leaders, just direct onto the reel. No messing around with braid or anything like that. Just got mono on because I'm only fishing at a nice short distance. I don't need braid. If I was on a river where all the flow was 30, 40 meters and for the first 20 meters there was no flow, that's when I get my braid rod out. But wherever you go, if you're gonna sit down and there's some flow, mono's the one because the flow naturally picks up that line as it is. So you just don't need braid and mono is a lot more forgiving, so you're gonna hit more bites with that anyway. And <clears throat> the setup couldn't be any simpler. I will just say that the, the mono's on my 520 extremity. Don't know if I've mentioned that before. Have I mentioned that before, Mr. Cameraman? Yeah, he says only a few times. 520 extremity, this is the reel for river fishing, all right? The end, there isn't anything else. This is the one, just winds my feeder back every time, no dramas. It's like my heavy feeder isn't even on the end and that's what I need because I could be winding in a hundred times today. So I don't want to be cranking my reel every time I wind in. I just want to be oh, leisurely winding and nice and steady. And that's what the 520 extremity gives me. So great combination that. Now <clears throat> my rig here, it couldn't really be much simpler to be honest because at the end of the six pound line, I've got some of the float stops all right, these have got a nice flat edge on them. And I've slid one of those onto the line there, as you can see. So if you imagine I've slid this onto the line, then I've slid a swivel on that I can attach my feeder to. Look, just free running there on the line. And then I've put two more float stops on there. Now, probably at this distance, those float stops would be enough to hold the feeder in place. But because I'm fishing with heavy feeders, I don't want any dramas. Like I've said, I want everything to be nice and reliable. What I've done then is I've got to the main line and I've actually done a three turn water knot and I've attached some O22 fluorocarbon below it. So literally it could be any line. It could be the O23 reel line. Most of the time I just bite off a piece of reel line and put it on. But you know, if we're trying to refine things a little bit, I've got this beautiful piece of fluorocarbon here below. It's up to you, but any thick line Honestly, any old line, it doesn't matter. A nice thick piece of line here. And all that means is the float stops can sit against that knot and they won't go over that knot. They're not gonna move over that knot. So it's dead easy to do. And obviously <clears throat> I've got my float stop here that sits and you have to mess around with this a little bit, but I usually put it about an inch. So there's about an inch of movement there for when the fish picks it up, the feeder hooks this stop and hooks itself. Now. Don't worry about a fixed rig or tethering a fish or a barbel or anything like that because if your line was to be cut off here, these float stops move so easy up the line that it just simply pull it off. And it's brilliant because if I get the feeder snagged while I'm trying to free the fish or whatever, this stop will move right up the line and I can free the fish. <coughs> Excuse me, it makes it a brilliant, brilliant rig because there's enough resistance there that the fish can, small fish and bream and barbel all hook themselves. But if it was really tugging or I was pulling, I've got the safety there that I'm not gonna get cracked off. It really is such a versatile rig. Now, all I did with this O22 fluorocarbon, at the bottom, I've got a little knot, tied a little overhand knot in the bottom and I've looped to loop my six inch hook length on. So I've got my six inch hook length boxes and I've just looped to loop them on. If you've got some of our meter long hook lengths that are pre-tied, you could just water knot them onto your main line or tie a little loop here and attach them to a loop. I've done it like this because I love this little six inch hook length as you've probably seen on some of my other videos. And this piece of line here is so stiff that it just doesn't give me any dramas. It doesn't tangle, it's out of the way, it all sinks nice and clean. It's dead, dead easy. Now, what I like to do is I like to start off by being quite aggressive and, and feeding quite a bit of bait. Let's take a little look at the bait because again, it, it's easy. There isn't anything too complicated with what I'm doing. I brought with me some Sony Baits Natural Hemp. I've got about three tins of that with me. I've got with me, I usually bring two pints. So I just get a few out at a time. So I've got two pints of casters. I've got a few worms. I don't need millions usually about half a kilo. Probably won't feed those, but I'll be using them on the hook as well. So just need an option, <coughs> excuse me. And then finally, I've got half a pint 
of squiggly red maggots. Now, they're great hook bait alternative. They're probably not something I'm gonna feed through the feeder today. I'm just gonna put my bait through the feeder. The ground bait is dead simple. Whenever I go on a river, I work on the theory that I wanna catch everything. If I was going fishing for a barbel or just bream, I'd probably have some fish meal. But for me, the mix is dead simple today. It's just a bag of Sona baits, so natural, black roach, all right? The black roach ground bait, it's got loads of crushed hemp in it, bread, crushed hemp, biscuit, etc. It's nice and sticky, so I don't have to mix it particularly damp. And what it does, it hits the bottom and it explodes out of the feeder. So I've got all that activity, the oil coming out of my feeder, drawing fish into where I'm fishing, and it's very neutral. If bream want to come in, barb will come in, they will still, <clears throat> they will still come in. But if you want to be catching like roach, dace, perch, those sorts of fish, they're also going to come to this mix. What I don't want to do is put fish meal in and put those other fish off. I just want to get a bite every single cast. That's my goal today. That's what I'm trying to show you guys. So what I do to begin with, I don't really know what I'm going to catch. <clears throat> so I put a handful of casters, handful of hemp, and a few chopped worms in one of these great tubs, which obviously drains all the excess liquid off. And I'm gonna fill my feeder with that bait. Now be careful, don't wanna go nuts on the, on the bait. I usually start with a large feeder. So I get the large solid feeder. You'll notice today on my side tray, I've only got these solid open end style feeders. I don't use anything else on a river. This is the feeder that I use on the river. I'm not, I've never been a fan. Maybe it's where I grew up. I grew up on the river, yeah. It was a fast flowing river and cage feeders just weren't the one. I don't want my bait being released anywhere but on the bottom. So for me, I need a solid feeder to nip my bait in, get it down to the bottom. And then when I wind in, release the bait into my peg. So you'll see here, these are the only feeders I have with me, they work absolutely brilliant. I've got them in all different weights, all different sizes. I usually start the session with that large feeder, not the extra large, like a large feeder. And what I tend to do is just scoop it half full of bait like that. So you can see like almost like nipped in, half of it's full with bait. And then I use the other half to literally just nip the ground bait in like that. So every cast I'm sort of feeding like, let's say, 50 grains of hemp, 20 casters, and a few bits of worms. So when that hits the bottom, it hits the bottom like this. Obviously the activity's there. Look, there's the bait comes out. Lovely smell and attraction from ground bait, but also some loose feed. And what I'm trying to replicate there is almost that baller chuck mentality. So you can imagine if this was in a ball with that ground bait, that's almost what I'm trying to replicate. So. If I was fishing a pole, I might have some ground bait with some hemp and casters and that in and throw balls in all the time. That's what I'm doing with the feeder. So I need my feeder to replicate that. Now, obviously if I start pumping the bait in with a large feeder every chuck, I'm gonna end up with a lot of bait there very fast. So I tend to have about seven or eight casts with that feeder. And each of those casts is literally no more than two minutes. I'm looking to cast out and wind in every two, two minutes to begin with, just to get some bait into the peg. So the most reliable way of doing that is by putting a maggot on, because a maggot, a single maggot, is gonna get you a bite quicker than anything else. So what I've got here, single maggot, I'm just gonna, on a 14, I put a 14N10 on, nice long shank to start with. Let's have a look at one of those. And I've hooked it through the tip. <clears throat> Lots of hook point exposed. I'm gonna nip my half feeder full of bait. I've got a small on here and I've got a 50 gram feeder. We'll talk about the weight in a minute. But let's see, I'm hoping, I've had a little, I have had a little fish with that bigger feeder just for about 20 minutes before I got started with you guys because I wanted you guys to sort of hopefully see a few bites from the start. So look, chuck my feeder in. We'll talk about the rod position in a minute. But obviously I want the feeder to get to the bottom and I'm looking at the tip all the time to see if there's any bangs. There's a couple of taps there straight away. And I'm just slowly bringing my rod round, popping it on the rest. There's two or three taps there straight away. There's a good chance it could even be a dace hanging on. Oh, there is. This, oh, that was a bit disappointing because that was something a bit bigger than a dace. Sorry about that, guys. I wasn't really paying attention there. 
What have we got? Oh, it's foul hooked, whatever that was. Big scale, look at that. Look at that, that was interesting. Well, see, if ever you want an example of you never know on a river, I don't know what fish that's from. We'll have to have a bit of an investigate, Mr. Cameraman. But I don't really know there what, but a great example. I literally had five or six chucks, and then I said, right, we'll start filming. So whatever it is, has been sitting there waiting for me, which is very interesting indeed. And look at this. The bite was very positive because it was foul hooked. And as a result, look, my stop has slid up the line. So it's done its job there. Apart from obviously being foul hooked, I was never going to get it out. But that's a shame. That would have been fun, wouldn't it, first chuck? Right, <clears throat> let's talk you through that again. So you can see why I want to put a maggot on. I want a, a, If that would have been a barbel or a bream or whatever that was, to be fair, hopefully it would have eaten my single maggot if it hadn't have hooked it in the side. Let's chuck it back out again. I've got a 50 gram on at the moment. We're going to talk about weight in a minute. So look, nice little cast out. Bring the rod back nice and quickly. Let your feeder go in. I bring the rod to the side like this. And I like to keep an eye on the tip. So I just slowly, oh look, little taps there all the time. I'm looking for something that really commit, really hooks itself aggressively. So I just keep a little bend in the tip the whole time and pop it onto the rod rest like that. Now, I'm hoping that obviously if there's some dace and small fish there, they're gonna be really aggressive. And I've already had a couple of taps on the way down. Now, because I've had a couple of taps on the way down, I'm sort of a bit like, hmm, it's a good chance my maggot's been pulled off or I've had something attack it. So I'm not bothered about picking up to wind in again. That's how proactive I'm happy to be if I feel there's some fish in the peg. So let's have a look. Sure enough, no maggot. So you can see there that whatever that tap was, whatever that tap was from that fish, it's actually pulled the maggot off the hook. So let's do that again. I would guess, my guess would be a dace because they're classic for pulling the, pulling the bait off. So again, half film a feeder with some bait, plug the ends, get that cast back in again. Now I've got to try and make sure this size of feeder's right, because what I don't want is I don't want an overly heavy feeder. I want my feeder to hold on the bottom, but without, I don't want it holding so much that effectively, I have a little tap there on the way down, that's why I've struck. I don't want it holding so much that effectively the fish bounce off it, which is what seems to be happening. So. Let me just take my bait off to show you exactly what I mean. So when I cast a feeder out, cast it into the peg, I keep the rod to the side so I've got some slack line, and then I watch the feeder hit the bottom. Now, generally speaking, I tend to just keep a little bend in the tip so I can watch it on the way down. And I put it all the way down as the, as the line is being picked up in the flow, and I tend to put it down like that. Now, what you've got to imagine is the feeder's out in front of me, and that line is bowing downstream. So my rod points downstream, and then it almost comes up and picks itself back up into the rod. Can you see what I mean? So effectively now, when I pick up on the strike, I'm picking up directly into the feeder. That's why it's important to have your rod there. So you're obviously picking up into the feeder. Now that feeder was clearly not moving because the rod tip was bent over. If I had a light feeder on, the pressure on that line would keep moving the feeder and the tip would be bouncing like this. So what I want is a situation where really my feeder is going to hold on the bottom nicely without bouncing. So that was 50 gram. Let's go down to a 30 gram. Again, I'm not going to put any bait on because I want to demonstrate it to you. So let's chuck this 30 gram out. Same thing. Cast it out. Keep my rod in the same place every time so I can judge it. All right, let's put this on the rest and see if 30 gram is enough to hold. So what I'm looking for now is it bends over like that. So look, it isn't bouncing back. That's perfect. So my feeder there is bending over. It's holding the bottom because if it wasn't, it'd be going like this. It'd be bouncing like this as it went down the, the river, but it's not. So 50 grams is far too heavy because 30 grams will just about hold the bottom. Now, I wouldn't go any lighter than 30 grams personally because I don't, I just, experience tells me it, it won't hold the bottom, but 
Let's see if we can see a difference now then, because we had a couple of taps there with the maggot on, with the heavy feeder. Let's put this lighter feeder on, which I believe is more, is holding the bottom a bit more critically balanced, let's say. Let's say it takes next to nothing to move that feeder. So let's chuck that in and we'll see the same. So I'll put the rod down to the side. I'm expecting bites quickly now because obviously we've had evidence of that. Oh, little tap there straight away. I'm just going down with the rod. And what I really want is if a fish hooks itself, I want the feeder to become dislodged. Now let's see, put it up on the rest there. So this is the, one, of, one of the things you'll notice is I haven't got the rod sky high. I don't want to be craning my neck looking up personally. I like to have the rod almost like in my upper eye line. That usually clears any vegetation and what have you so I can see the tip perfectly. But also it allows me to just sit a little bit more comfortable because I'm going to spend quite a bit of the day looking at my quiver tip. So there was a little tap as I chucked out. So again, has the fish taken my maggot? Yes, it has. So this is what I'm saying. I'm trying to get a feel. I'm going to tell you now that I've got quite a lot of experience with this type of fishing. So usually I would change a lot quicker than this, but I, I'm trying to give you guys the, the idea, the understanding of what we're doing. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Just because my maggot's getting pulled off a little bit easier, I'm going to make my first change and I'm going to, thread my maggot on a little bit. So it's now threaded on the hook. Let's see what happens there. Will I, I might miss some bites. I might hit some more bites. Again, we don't know. That's what happens with river fishing. We haven't actually caught a fish yet. We've only just started fishing. So we're trying our best to read it. Now, like I said, the bites seem to come quite quickly. So this time I'm gonna follow my tip, see what happens. Oh, look, rattle there, rattle again. So I know that that fish can't have pulled the maggot off. He might have obviously destroyed it. Look how quickly, whatever it is, whatever fish are down there are attacking that. They are attacking that quickly. So I might need something a little bit more robust. I might need a bigger hook. These are the changes you've got to make when you feed a fishing on a river. I tend to not wait very long if I've had a bite, if I've had a tap or a rattle. And that's why it's so important to follow the feeder down. I don't tend to wait too long. So you can see I'm in and out all the time, I'm busy. So this time my maggot's still on, but it's been absolutely obliterated. So there's obviously a lot of fish there. Now, one of the things that tends to cause this is, is a fish called dace. Now dace are obviously, <clears throat> they're very, I'm going to say quick feeders. They spot something straight away. So I'm going to put a little piece of worm on because it seems to me that these dace are just attacking anything and everything straight away. So I need something quite tough to try and withstand that attack, if you like. So let's just cast that out again. This time, let's see what happens because I think that bait that's a little bit tougher might just withstand the battering. Look, I mean, it's, cra it's crazy. That rod is just tapping as soon as the, as soon as the bait hits the bottom, I'm getting, or as soon as the feed is falling, I'm getting taps and dinks and, and indications on the rod straight away. But the trouble is with taps and dinks on a feeder is they don't tend to be on. So what you're trying to do, see a nice big drop back there, but again, not on. So. I'm glad this is happening because I want, this is, the, this is why I love river feeder fishing. You've got to be prepared to adapt all the time. So I take that hook off on my short little, on my short little rig. And I'm gonna change to a 14 N20. Now an N20 has got a wider gape on it. The N10 is a very narrow gape hook. So it seems to me like the fish aren't bothered about the hooks one bit. They're attacking the bait really fast, but I'm not, I'm not hitting the bite. So what am I gonna do to try and hit the bite? So let's try, a, let's try a bigger hook. And now, I'm not gonna lie to you, an N20 is the hook I usually go with, but obviously I like to show people exactly what's happening. So 
let's put that little piece of worm on, but this time we've got a wider gape hook. So let's see if we can hit a bite. Do we need a, a heavier feeder? Do we need to shorten up that gap between the two stops? I don't know. This is what river feeder fishing is about. Do I need to change the bait? Are the fish a little bit unsettled? Will they settle down as time goes on? Again, I don't know. There was a big fish there. It could have been a pike. It could have been a little bit unsettled. There's lots of things going on. So let's see now if the 14, that seems better. Now that was a much more definitive tap. So as soon as it hit the bottom, my rod was going bang, 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 bang. And that's because that fish, which is a dace, which is what I thought it, they would be, has got that piece of uh, worm in his mouth, look, and he's hooked through the bottom lip. But when you look at the mouth, look how wide that dace's mouth is. So you can imagine as they suck in your maggot, your worm, your caster, whatever that might be, they've got a very wide open mouth and they're obviously smashing the bait and not hooking themselves. So that's why I love that N20 because it's got a wider gape on it than that N10. And that wider gape, even though, the, even though the hook is the same size, has made a difference there straight away by hitting the first bite that we've had. Now, again, let's see what happens. I'm almost just keeping like a little bend in the rod. Like, look, there's a little few dinks in there. And we've got another one. So I'm looking for the, oh, it's just come off. I'm looking for those little taps and dinks. And again, I'm just gonna have to balance the feeder. Maybe I need a 40 gram version. So we've tried a 50. Is this 30 gram a little bit too light perhaps? I don't know. Again, you can see I'm busy. I'm not a lazy feeder angler. I'm just chucking out. I'm being active. I'm thinking all the time. Oh, I'm getting rattles all the time there. Has that hit the bottom? Look. So that fish has hooked itself against my feeder as soon as it went down. Look how fast the bite are. Is. Look how fast and quickly you can imagine. They're great stamp fish. Look at that. It's like a three ounce dace. So the beautiful, beautiful fish, they really are. I know it'll probably jump out of my hand because dace like to do that. But look, dead chunky, dead thick set. Beautiful, beautiful fish. You can build up a real weight of those if you were in a competition, but even if not, they're just such a beautiful fish to catch. Now that's good. We're, we've already changed and we're doing a bit better now. We've hit two out of the last three bites. That's pretty good. So it seems to me like there's a lot of fish, so I can fish with a worm. I'm just half filling this feeder still because I'm realizing that those fish are eating the bait, but it's like any sort of feeder fishing. You get too much bait in your peg, all you're gonna do is miss bites. So again, maybe those few feeder fulls at the start was just a bit much, but letting it hit the bottom, I'm just gonna keep that a bit tight. Oh, it's absolutely solid. Look at that. So now we're three from four. Oh, is that, don't tell me that's come off. Oh no. Well, actually two from four and two come off. That's not very good, is it? So. Let's have a little look. No, all looks good, all looks good. But look how quickly the bites are coming. Now we've got to be careful because yeah, we can feed some bait, but it might be a case of having every other chuck with just ground bait in it. Because I'm really, now I'm thinking, wow, I'm winding in fast. There's clearly a lot of fish here today. So there's gonna be a lot of competition in my peg. That's interesting. That time wasn't a bite straight away. Let's see, and look, I'm just trying to keep everything nice and tight all the way down. All the way down. Oh, that's a big bang. Is he on? No. Right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let's make a little adjustment. This is why I love these sessions, because it's great for you guys to watch. I'm going to take that feeder off and see if I can just find a 40 gram version. Because I've got a feeling that that feeder is just a little bit too light. I've got a feeling that that feeder, they're just not quite, there we go, there's 40 grams. Now I've got a feeling this might be a bit better. This, I think the fish are attacking that hook bait so quickly, right, that they need to hook themselves against something and they can't. I could even try shortening the hook length perhaps to a shorter hook length. But personally, I think the bites are coming on the drop. So I don't really want to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to put a piece of worm in again. Half full that feeder. But you can see the technique and you can see how brilliant it can be in terms of like getting bites and working. Let's chuck that out. 
try again, rod in the same spot every single time, let it hit the bottom. Now, and this time I've got a heavier feeder, so I'm actually just going to be a, keep the rod tip a bit slacker. Oh, that's worked straight away. So with that time, what happened was I saw the tip just start bouncing, and that's because that dace, whoa, look at the size of them. That dace has hooked itself against that slightly heavier feeder. So you can see the refinements that I have to make as a feeder angler. And let me tell you now, this won't stay the same all day, far from it. We'll be fishing with, <clears throat> I could try a size 12 hook. I could have to go back to the lighter feeder. We might have to start waiting a long time for bites. We're gonna have to adapt all the day. What about if I move this stop right down here? I don't know what's gonna happen by the way with this, but I'll put that stop right on top of that feeder. So now the feeders just can only rattle against the swivel and I've got 40 grams. So let's see now when we chuck out. Again, same thing. What I'm looking for is ideally the fish to hook itself against the feeder. So really I can let that hit the bottom and just keep a little light bend and I'm looking for almost the feeder to start bouncing down the river and that'll be a sign to tell me that I've got a dace on, which I'm gonna say I have, yeah. Look, it wasn't even tightening up there. So that dace has hooked itself against the feeder. And now you can see, oh, we're cooking on gas. So by making a few changes, by adapting, by trying to read the river, read the situation, see what is happening, we're really doing really well. So. If you want to go out and do some feeder fishing on a river, you can see the setup is super easy. The bait selection is super easy. You don't have to cast far. And on another day, these might be bream. On another day, these might be big roach. They might be barbel. There isn't really that much difference apart from, oh, it's just come off, <laughs> typical. Apart from you get to enjoy a beautiful day in beautiful surroundings catching fantastic fish. So hope you've enjoyed that little insight to feeder fishing on a river. See you next time. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Cheers.